Hello, everybody. This is Martin Pitella for Life Enthusiast Online Radio and uh, Internet and Television Network. Well, mostly it's on the Internet. Today, I'm here with Spencer Feldman, the CEO and Chief Formulator at Remedy Link. And we're ready to talk to you today about the killer number two, the uh, second most popular way to end your life prematurely, at least in the Western societies, Western industrialized. It's probably on the rise anywhere the industrial lifestyle reaches. Anyway, hello, Spencer Feldman. Hey, Martin. Nice to be back. Hey, so what do you think? Um, are we able to explain to people why they should attend to their health in a preventive manner, why they should actually do things that don't seem to have a payoff other than that they don't check out prematurely in pain. Well, the way the body is designed is it has a huge reserve capacity. And what that means is uh, most people won't have symptoms until a situation becomes relatively dire. Uh, so it's not a matter of, I think if somebody waits for something to feel bad, uh, they're already behind the curve. Right, yeah, like the definition of a tumor, if I remember right, well, by the time a tumor can be palpated, it already has its own blood supply and it already has a life of its own, right? But we'll get into it. Um, the blood supply happens at around half a, uh, a, cubic, uh, half a cubic centimeter. Yeah, I half a know. cubic centimeter is about the, the size of this, which is the eraser on my pencil, not very thick. This, Martin, this is why I like to do ultrasound. Um, you know, most, for uh, example, um, when I work with female clients, there's a piece of equipment I have that they actually wear that simulates their breasts with five tumors in them. And I have my clients go and put this on the front like a, uh, like a giant um, silicon apron, right? It looks like a Halloween gag. And then they can go and, and practice, yeah, practice testing for, for, for um, tumors. And I, you know, I say, look, you know, you'll pass, you know, out of all the tests you, you, you've done in school, this is the one you want to pass. You pass when you find all of them, and I'm not going to tell you how many there are. You have to find them all. Okay. As, you know, most breast cancers are found by women in the shower, right? Yeah. So um, I want everyone, all the women that I work with, uh, I would love to see high schools uh, have this in health class where all the, all the girls are shown how to palpate for themselves breast cancer. Um, because I want to find out these things as soon as humanly possible. And that means they have to be good at doing this. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a manual skill. If you uh, look at cancer, the, the top three are uh, lung, colon, and then breast for women and prostate for men. Now, lung cancer, you know, don't smoke cigarettes, <laughs> okay? Colon cancer, uh, I think a lot of that is being caused obviously by diet, but more specifically, uh, when you cook meats at high temperatures. Right. I create certain uh, deep, deep fry deep fryer is the most evil invention of the kitchen appliances. I don't mind a deep fryer if it's fresh oil. I fry my food all the time. Yeah, but, but who's going to have that? Not right, in a no, restaurant. Not in a restaurant. It's too expensive. Yeah, you know what it costs to put a whole quart of fresh olive oil every time to deep fry something? It's not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. So there's the deep frying, but even beyond the not just that because that's the, the breakdown of the fat, right? Then there's the changing of the proteins, uh, and that happens to meat at high temperature, so. Yeah, charbroil. Yeah. yeah, right, so what I do is my meat is typically uh, cooked in a slow cooker. Right, yeah. Temperatures. Yeah, so braised what? and boiled and stewed, yeah. Right, right, and then I'll take it out and I'll you know, sear it for a few seconds for flavor for the Maillard reaction. Mm. So uh, that's the colon, right? Don't. Well, I would, I would like to actually add to that, more water, more fiber. Sure, absolutely. Uh, and we could spend a whole hour just talking about the crypts inside the colon and how they get plugged and the stem cells. I don't know. But let's, let's just say, don't cook your food at very high temperatures. Uh, and if you are, 
uh, if you add a little bit of lemon juice, it seems to um, slow that reaction down. And then you've got the, the breast and the prostate. Now this is a much more difficult one to avoid because I believe this is being put, um, uh, amp this is coming to, this is such a, a common cancer because of plasticizers. And it's hard to avoid that in today's society. I would say that those two are the deficiency of iodine. Most mm -hmm, that's too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And of course, that's a, that's a rampant and epidemic problem because people are just not eating enough seaweed. Yeah, but let me say this, you know, there, when I look at people's thyroids and I see an enlarged thyroid, the first thing I'm thinking is, you know, is this person getting enough iodine? But a lot of times I'll see um, an autoimmune, I look at the, I use the thyroid as an autoimmune meter, right? Yes. If I don't see any vascularity in the thyroid, no, let me back up. When I see too much vascularity in the thyroid, I'm thinking autoimmune. The body's going in and attacking too much, right? And if I don't see any vascularity in it at all, I'm thinking a Th2 dominant, low um, immune system, because I want to see at least a little bit of going in there and cleaning things up. And so for me, it's, uh, I use the thyroid to monitor Th1, Th2 kind of autoimmunity uh, ratios as my bellwether. It's so easy right. to see. Just found. And so if you give certain people thyroid, you can make them worse because they're already in the middle of a thyroid storm. So, you know, yes, iodine, but not for everybody. Oh, yes, of course. Always, yes. Treat the patient. Yes, yes, exactly. So uh, let's talk a little. You know, a cancer is a great tragedy. If half of us get it, um, that means either we or someone we love is going to go through it. And unlike a heart attack that, you know, if you either if you survive it, you survive, you don't, you don't. You know, cancer is a long, drawn-out heart-wrenching experience for anyone that's watched someone go through it. So I want to empower the audience with what my journey and understanding what cancer is and my attempts to keep my friends, myself, my family, my loved ones safe. It's the best that I could. I wanted to, to, to make those that I cared about as cancer-proof as possible. And so to do that, I had to understand it. So I'd like to take your listeners on the journey of discovery I took about what I think cancer is. Okay, so uh, there's a number of triggers for cancer. Let's, let's say four main triggers. Uh, one is low oxygen levels. If the oxygen level gets to a certain point, then the, cancer, the, the cells um, cannot enter necessarily the Krebs cycle where they can burn sugar and fat and, and, and protein. They go into glycolysis, which is how you burn sugar in the absence of oxygen. And, um, right. And so the challenge is once a cell makes that, and why would someone be low on oxygen? Well, that takes us back to toxicity and circulation and those kind of things, right? Be uh, balance as well. Yeah. So uh, the, the, when, the ox, when it makes that shift to, uh, to glycolysis, sometimes it's an irreversible shift. It won't come back. So even if you manage to give someone a lot of oxygen, put them in a hyperbaric chamber, give them oxidative therapies, it may be too late if it's, if it's irreversibly shifted. Um, the, uh, the, another aspect is the acidity. Now, the acidity can be caused by the glycolysis because of the, the lactic acid, but it can also be caused just by diet and, and all sorts of things. So another thing that happens is as the tissue becomes more acidic, that is the trigger for a tumor to go from the small non-issue to the invasive issue. And let me explain this. If you were to, uh, when they do autopsies on people that die of car crashes in their 40s, 50s, right? People that are ostensibly healthy. Uh, half the men and women have microtumors in their breast and prostate, approximately. Now, that's just those two areas. And they're not even looking in the colon and in the, the lung and all the other places. So what they have is these little things. They're basically like little warts in the body, on the inside. They don't have a big blood supply. They don't invade. They don't cross tissue boundaries. Not a big deal. So this would, be, this would be like a flaw that's walled off and under control, yeah? 
Yeah, you know, the body uh, has ways of keeping those microtumors at microtumor size, right? It's about, a, like we said, it's about a half a cubic centimeter. And once it gets past that, in order to grow past that, it has to have a bigger blood supply. And so it's the, and that's where you hear people doing anti-angiogenics. So the body has an ability to deal with these things as long as it can keep them like small warts it's not a big deal, but the acidity from the glycolysis and from bad diet and such is one of the triggers to make that microtumor start becoming vascular and invasive. Then there's two other things. One is the standard model, right? I've given you two alternative models, and not alternative because you know a Warburg and you know heavy hitter scientists were working on this. But mostly what the traditional establishment says is cancer is caused by mutation. So we talked about uh, oxygen, low oxygen. We talked about low, uh, low pH. The traditional no. Western establishment is- Well, and, and I just need to butt in. Yes. That's not the cause. That's the symptom. Mm -hmm. Right? For which? Well, oh, the low, yeah, the sure, mutation, caused by some, yeah. The mutation wasn't caused by mutation. The mutation was caused by one of the preceding issues, either presence of toxins or absence of oxygen or both? Well, I, I divide mutation into two types. Uh, there is the, it, it is said that it takes six to seven mutations of a cell for it to become cancerous. Now, sometimes you get somebody who's, uh, you know, like you fly in a plane, you're getting x-ray, right? So we are exposed to radiation, we are exposed to mutations, uh, but I think one of the big causes of mutations is chemical toxicity. And so, you know, sure, um, a little bit of food coloring isn't gonna kill somebody. And sure, uh, a little bit of new car smell isn't going to kill someone. And yes, a little bit of plastic sizers uh, on, their, on their chicken that it's wrapped in is not gonna kill someone. And, and yes, a little bit of off-gassing formaldehyde from their new carpet won't kill them. But these tests have never been done synergistically. They've all been taken one at a time. And when you add all these things together, it can add, it had a, have an additive or multiplicative effect. So we are exposed to an enormous amount of chemicals. Here is the chart for uh, cancer in the last century. And you can see that uh, it's starting uh, in the 50s, and it's just going up from there. And here is the chart of chemical manufacturing in the last century. And you can see it starts in the 50s and goes up from there. Now, if you lay these two charts on top of each other, again, this is the same chart. Now, so, when you say chemicals, do you mean like the petroleum industry growing? I mean the entire chemical industry, but yes, petrochemicals. Plastics and petrochemicals specifically. Right, one and the same thing, really. Yeah, so one way in which we develop cancer is exposure to chemicals, and this causes mutations. And then there is a fourth way, which is kind of like the, the beginning, which I would call an adaptative mutation. What I mean by this is, uh, when the environment that the cell is in becomes dysfunctional, becomes um, not toxic from exogenous toxins, but toxic from the stuff that the body makes it can't get rid of, the cell eventually mutates to or adapts to this new environment, and that adaptation is cancer. That's a slow adaptation. So it's mutation, but it's adaptive mutation, whereas chemical mutation is damaging mutation, two different types of mutation. Okay, so the, in the same way that if you take a very, jump in a cold pool of water, epigenetically you train your body to change its genetic um, manifestation uh, to deal with that by increasing testosterone and um, improving your immune system, the body responds to its environment. This is a negative epigenetic response of the cells. Um, it's believed that cancer cells mostly come from progenitor cells, which are halfway between stem cells and normal cells, but it, these are what I think the drivers. It's chemical mutation 
metal and um, so the presence of oxygen and low pH, and then it's the buildup of toxins, endogenous toxins. And so let's talk about um, why does this happen? Why do toxins build up in the cell? The cells in their membranes uh, have uh, pumps, transporters, and channels. Uh, and the, these are used to control homeostatically what is inside the cell. For instance, the cell wants lots of potassium, very little calcium. And so it's constantly pushing against the osmotic gradient to bring the potassium in and push the, the calcium and, and sodium out. So a pump does this by, but it takes energy. It takes ATP to run a pump. A transporter, and there's two types, there's antiporters and symporters, uh, they are more like revolving doors. They will, uh, so if this is the membrane and here is the, uh, here is the transporter, let's say there's something here that wants to get in and something here that the cell wants to get out. It'll grab onto both and use the energy of this one coming down to push that one out or vice versa, right? Uh, and that's a, a, an antiporter. And a symporter is maybe there's two things up here and this, the osmotic pressure wants to pull in this one, the cell wants that one, and it uses the osmotic force of this to pull them both in, okay? That's a symporter. And then you've got channels, which are basically little holes, little funnels, that things just come through in mass, just, just shoots right through. Uh, and this is a fantastic system, but there's a flaw to it. So the flaw is called molecular mimicry. And what happens is some metals that are toxic look like metals that are good for us. Um, well, we have, we have the uh, t table of elements and uh, we humans are designed to operate mostly with the elements that are lower, the smaller weights mm -hmm. of the table of the elements, like the calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, in, in that, the first four layer levels, right? Yeah, that's why they call them heavy metals, why? because they're, they're larger. They're further down, yeah, further down on the table with the larger molecular weights. Anyway, go on into the explaining the mimicry. It's a most fascinating topic. Sure, so as an example, let's take mercury and sodium. They both have a size of 1.02 angstroms, which is tiny, but almost identical in size, even though they're different in weights. Um, however, divalent mercury has a positive two charge and sodium is a positive one charge. So what I think happens is the body was, is trying to maybe pull a little sodium in and grab some mercury by mistake. But the mercury now has got this stronger charge it gets into the transporter, the symporter, the antiporter, the channel, the pump, and won't let go and sticks there. And now it's just like some guy, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, jamming up the toilet or sitting in the middle of um, a revolving door when everybody's trying to get in and out and just not moving. You know, you can cause problems, right? Yep. Uh, barium is another example. Barium, which, you know, people are, are, are given barium. Uh, in the medical establishment for, uh, you know, for contrast such dyes and things. Barium has got a, an angstrom size of 1.35 and potassium 1.38. Now, that's almost exactly the same. And just keep in mind that atoms aren't billiard balls. They're a little squishy. You know, they have a little give and take. So, uh, indeed, uh, barium lowers potassium, lowers intracellular potassium in the body, just like mercury uh, gets jammed up in uh, the sodium pumps. So as we are exposed to toxic metals, they get into these pumps and transporters and channels, they lock them up, and it's like somebody pouring cement into your toilet at home, right? And cement to your toilet and crazy glue into your door lock and nailing all your windows shut, you know? And, 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 and maybe you get a little bit of water through your faucet if you're lucky. You know, when this happens, you know, that, that house is gonna stink pretty soon because it's, it's generating things that need to go out the toilet and the people are gonna get upset because they can't get any food in or not as much. So when I talked about earlier the uh, kind of cancer that can form by adaptation, this is the, what I think is causing it. It's the metals are jamming up 
well, gluing up all the pumps transport or some of the pumps transporters and channels so that the oxygen, um, the nutrition can't get in and the toxins can't get out. And eventually the cell says, well, hmm, what do I need to do to survive? Let me go back to my genetic library. Let me see if I can, oh, look, here's a book. This book is how to survive in a toxic environment. And first page of the book says, um, you want to detoxify yourself. So um, you try to push it out. Right, and what, one of the things it'll do is uh, it will increase what's called a P-glycoprotein. Uh, and P-glycoproteins are sort of the, the general detoxifier of the cell. And it's very, it's nonspecific. It can get rid of lots of stuff. And so it says, okay, I'll, I'll make some P-glycoprotein um, proteins. And it does that and it helps, but it's getting worse. They make more, they make more, they make more. Eventually you've got a cell chock full of P glycoproteins. And at some point in time, it says, well, this isn't working. What's chapter two say, say to do? Chapter two, oh, there's another way that I can survive in this low pH, low acid, poor fuel, toxic environment, uh, known as cancer. And mm -hmm. reluctantly, it will then start reading off that code. Yeah, we go to fermentation. We become a very voracious user of glucose, and we go to the dark side, so to speak, quote unquote. Right. So um, let's talk about some interventions we can do with this. Um, in terms of low oxygen, we can do oxygen therapies and ozone and, hy and hyperbaric. But again, once the cell has made the transition, it's usually not, it's not going to go back. It might, it, it's great for keeping other cells from making the transition, right? So yes. if at any point in time a person has a million, you know, cells that are a little funky, right? Some of them have three mutations, some four, some five, some six, some are seven and are, are cancerous. The oxygen might, uh, the role of oxygen is there to, I think, keep the ones that are at three, four, and five and going to six and seven. Once they're, once they're cancerous, I don't think that's enough. Um, same with ketogenic diet. Uh, cancer cells cannot eat fat. So if you're on a ketogenic diet, fantastic. But remember, the body makes its own sugar. So you'll never be completely in ketosis because you're never going to starve the cancer sugar completely because your liver will make it for you or for the cancer. Yeah. Again. Glycolysis carries on. Right, right. So, so again, ketogenic diet. Fantastic with cancer, I'm sure. But again, once the tumor you know, has gotten to a certain point, um, not necessarily gonna be something uh, that's gonna, it's gonna be the game changer. And just one thing about ketogenesis, you know, um, you'd need a certain amount of sugar spiking in your bloodstream to have the insulin clear the proteins for tryptophan to get in your brain. So if you have, if you are experimenting with a ketogenic diet and you find you're getting very depressed, have one day a week where you have some carbs just to get the tryptophan in, right? <laughs> just experiment with that. Um, so uh, let's talk about cell voltage. I think this is an important part of the whole, the whole concept. Uh, cells are like little batteries and they have to have a certain voltage to be able to operate. And the way the voltage happens is by the pumps, um, pulling the potassium in, pushing the sodium out, it creates a, a differential that is part of what uh, generates the voltage. Now, normal cells, healthy cells, are between 38 and 93 millivolts, you measure them. Cancer cells are usually uh, below 38 millivolts. Well, they actually can go all the way to the positive instead of negative. Right, now, prostate tissue is pretty much the only tissue that tends to be really low, and that's why I think it's so susceptible to cancer is because it's already got a low voltage. Right. Now, if you take cancer a cell and bring its voltage up to negative 70, it stops growing. If you take a healthy cell and drop its voltage, it becomes cancerous. So right. that's, the, that's the big switch, right? That's the yes. big dial you turn. And so you get things like multi-wave oscillators and all the electrical therapies. And these are great at raising voltage, but they do it temporarily because they're not addressing the toxin metals in the pumps, transporters, and channels that are what's causing the lack of voltage. Right? So again, great protocol, but 
we need to get the toxins out so the body can manage its own uh, its own voltage. Mm. Do you happen to have one of those tables where the uh, different elements uh, substitutions are explained, like uh, like yeah, I haven't sodium, seen that. sodium, right. mercury, or magnesium, and uh, I don't know what. Do you have one of those? I haven't seen any one of them, and if you find one, please send it to me. What I've had to do is uh, look at the table of ionic radiuses and match the radiuses up. Uh, but as an example, I gave you uh, two sets that were very close, but lead will displace calcium, and they're actually quite a bit different. So it doesn't have to be as tight as, as uh, mercury and sodium or barium potassium. If it's anywhere close, it can get stuck in there too. Okay. Maybe it has something to do with the valence layers or who knows what. <laughs> yeah, it has to do with, you know, there's some, uh, the, the physics of the, the spin and the charge and the size of the molecule, what's the atom and what's it around. It gets pretty complex. It's enough just to say molecular mimicry exists. I want the bad metals out. And right. that's, 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 that's enough for me. Yeah, um, well, I, I mean, I have my standard little uh, chat, chant, which says, on. Yes, you need to get in the oxygen, but the oxygen, no matter how much you pump in, will not get carried to the cell until the pH of the carriers of the fluids is corrected, but that still doesn't deliver until the internal milieu, the terrain of the cell itself, is corrected because presence of toxins will block the function. And you just went ahead and explained it in a great technical detail. <laughs> So um, we've got this, the voltage is something we want to we want to talk about. But again, um, ketosis, oxygen, voltage, these are all great things. Um, but let's uh, they're not necessarily strong enough, I don't think, once the once the tumor's really taken off. Uh, so the traditional model is the chemotherapy model, typically. Um, Kill everything, hope the uh, body survives. Well, okay, I don't have a problem with surgery for cancer if it's done well, okay? I, don't, I think it's great to take that load off the body, but understand that that did not cure the milieu. You know, now you bought yourself some time, uh, but the, the, prob the, the causative, the, cause the sparks are still being tossed, are still going into the fuel. You, do, you put out the fire, but the sparks are still going. Don't, don't stop now. Um, what I do have a huge issue with is biopsies. I have an enormous issue with biopsies. And my issue is when you put the needle in to, buy up, uh, to, to get a stamp tumor, and then you pull the needle out, little bits of tumor are going to get seeded. So let's say you were right. Let's say your suspicion was correct and it was a tumor, and you biopsied it and you pulled it out. You're now seeding that tumor in a line all the way out as, you, as the needle leaves the body. And that's the seed for future cancers. It, it, it's my opinion that when cancer gets to a certain size, when it's got its own blood vessel and it's got its own ev evolution, removing the causes is not enough. That someone could completely remove the causes and that cancer is still gonna go. At mm. a certain point where it's now got a life and an intelligence of its own. There, there's more to it. Like yeah. one of the standard uh, big points that I want to make is that there's vibrational aspect to every illness and cancer happens to travel on the emotion of unforgiveness. Yes. And that thing alone plays a huge role. And, and I, I don't know how to even touch it, but the person who's involved, if they have a grudge and hold it against whatever that may be, the creator, the brother, sister, father, mother, whatever, if they stick with that vibration, they have a much greater chance of, not healing. Right. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more, Martin. Uh, so I'm not a fan of biopsies uh, because I believe that they can spread a tumor. And what I am a fan of is if you are the kind of, if you were going to, all right, so the rationale for a biopsy, and I understand it, right, is, hey, we don't want to do something as invasive as radiation or surgery or as toxic as chemotherapy, unless we're sure you have a cancer. So that's noble, right? That's first do no harm. I get it. I understand it. Uh, but if you take into consideration, you may be spreading a tumor, uh, then, so there, the, what I would prefer to do is if there was something where I had even a suspicion 
that it was cancer. I would start working as if it is. I would say, you know what? I'm not even going to take the, I'm not even interested in the biopsy. One, because one, if it is, it might spread it. And number two, even if it isn't cancer now, if, it, if I'm suspicious enough to take a biopsy or have, or, you know, if some, I'm not a doctor, I can't take a biopsy, but if I was suspicious enough to think biopsy, then maybe it's precancerous. Maybe it's got four mutations, five mutations, right? Yeah. And I think it's the, you know, so the medical establishment, Western medicine has these, has these big guns that they only want to bring out if they really have to. But if we can work at this, uh, in this window of opportunity before, right? Someone has something, it's, got, it's something, it's not too bad, it's not out of control yet. It's, that's where I want to work. Now, part of this model came because chemotherapy came around the same time uh, as penicillin. Now, penicillin was the, the wonder drug of the time, right? And uh, it did its work in a day or two or three, right? And, you know, you put a little penicillin on a Petri dish, wow, come back 24 hours later, amazing, amazing improvement. So when researchers were looking at how to deal with cancer, they had the same mindset uh, as when they were looking at penicillin. They're like, okay, let's test things against cancer. If it doesn't kill it in a day or two, we're not interested. I think that's the wrong uh, approach. That's an, uh, an acute infection approach. And cancer is not acute infection, it's a chronic situation. Let's say there was something that maybe at day five, day 10, that cancer would start to turn. They're not gonna see those. They're filtering those kind of, those kind of things out. And that's the kind of change we wanna make in the tissue. We want to gradually coax this tissue. Right. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. And it's, it's correct. I mean, I want to support the standard life rhythms. Some cells divide faster, some cells divide slower. Some want to replace much quicker, and those should have the fast change, but other tissues are slower moving. So there's... Right. So natural medicine, the things that are slow and gradual, that work at the milieu, the environment, these things have been, uh, there's been a selection bias against them in the chemotherapy uh, mindset. Yeah. Right, and so right they are to wait to do a biopsy in their mind because they think it's harmless and they don't wanna do something nasty or toxic or invasive, they don't have to. Okay. From another perspective, we could say, but wait, alternative medicine, natural medicine has all of these things that you have, sel have selectively biased against based on your model for testing that are not toxic and you can use them additively you can you know you would never do 10 different chemotherapy agents at once you know the person wouldn't survive a day you know let alone three or four of them but you can take 10 different supplements at one time and have that additive effect you remember i talked about the p glycoprotein before about how the cell as it's evolving on its way to cancer becomes better and better at removing toxins okay so by the time a cancer cell, cells become cancerous. It has been, it is so good at removing toxins. It's, it is the most toxic proof cell in the human body, a cancer cell. And the idea of using a poison to kill it. Is it's not counterintuitive, isn't it? It's counterintuitive. It's not, it's not, it's not tactical. You know, the art of war, Sun Tzu, right? You, you don't attack an enemy where it's strong. You attack it where it's weak. It's strong at dealing with toxins. It's been practicing toxins, dealing with toxins for five to seven years. It's got so many P-glycoprotein molecules on it. It's fine. And this is what creates the, um, the multi-drug resistant cancers, right? They're like, well, why, why is it dumping out the cancer? Why is the cancer dumping out the chemo as soon as I give it to it? Well, because that's what it's been trained to do for five to seven years, which is normally how long it takes for a cancer to go, right? Right, right. So I wanted to be able to have some way of uh, putting uh, my body in a, in a, in a chance of uh, being uh, healthier and more resistant. And so what I did was I looked in the animal kingdom. I said, you know, humans are not the only animals that get cancer. We're one of the few ones that get heart attacks. We are not one of the few ones that get cancer. Lots of animals that get cancer. And so has the genius of evolution come up with a solution for dealing with cancer? And I identified three animals. 
the elephant, the ant, and the naked mole rat. So let's talk about these. There is a protein called TP, uh, TP53. And we have one gene for TP53. Elephants have 20 of them. And the TP53 gene, what it does is it causes cell arrest, repair, and apoptosis. So what it does is if the cell is getting a little, a little funky, it'll stop its growth, it'll fix it if it can, and it'll kill it if it can't. So it's one of the body's innate cancer surveillance systems. Yep. We, have, we have one of them, elephants have 20. Elephants have far less cancer than we do, even though they're much bigger, right? Now, half of all cancers in humans are associated with the TP53 gene, which means if that one gene in us goes off, there goes our main cancer protection. So one thing is, and I'll talk about it, is what can we do to be more like elephants? Well, elagic acid does the same things. It Up regulates the TP53 function. It is, yeah, uh, elagic acid can cause cell arrest, repair, and apoptosis. So I believe that elagic acid acts as a external supplemental TP53 gene. And I think that by taking elagic acid, I'm becoming more like the elephant. Right on. Okay. Um, so then ants, very, I don't think there's ever found any cancer in an ant. Now, granted, they don't live that long. Interesting thing about ants, they don't really have an immune system. What they have is a impeccable genetic repair system. They say, I don't care what kind of, what kind of bugs come my way. I'm going to repair the damage so fast, it doesn't even matter. It's a different perspective. The elephant said, I want lots of TP53 genes. The ant said, Deep, you know, uh, the best, you know, give me a great defense. Now, uh, one of the things that I, so the element or one of the elements of the aldehydes that was identified by Hans Nieper, the great German physician, in ants that was giving them this amazing gene repair capacity was iridoidal. I'm pronouncing it right. And what I like to do is I like to take iridoidal. Now, one day. Could you spell it, please? Just speak this. Uh, is I'm sure. It's I R I D O D I A L. Okay. Now, one day, a big pharma house or someone is going to figure out how to make this stuff by the 55 gallon drum, and I'll be taking spoonfuls of it. Uh, of course, it's not patentable. So, you know, it's going to have to be someone who just wants to, you know, help people. Well, I mean, right now, right now there is an ant, uh, I don't know what you call it, black ant uh, powder Chinese medicine, right? Yes, there is. And what I do is to be more like the ant, I eat ants. Uh, it's a black powder. It may be a little bit like coffee. You know, it doesn't bother me. It's ground up. Yeah. Mix it up. I remember in the Chinese medicine uh, book it says this is the most yin element in nature yin or yang i thought it was yin i could be bad i could be backwards because the uh, the ant is the strongest pound for pound creature on the planet right the most male is what i'm thinking yeah yang. so it's, it's a very okay so i'm i'm mispronouncing it sorry it's okay um so yeah so um people have been taking uh, ant extract uh, as um, kind of like an anti-aging uh, elixir. Or, uh, some people use it uh, um, before races. It does give a lot of energy. There is that stamina. For me, I'm taking it because I want the iridoidal. I want the uh, gene repair substance. And then that takes us to the naked mole rat. These are these um, underground um, hairless rats. Now, interesting creatures. Compared to uh, like a mouse of the same size, the naked mole rat lives seven times longer. And they are immune to cancer. When I mean immune to cancer, from what I understand, you cannot give them cancer in the lab. They can't get it. Interesting. All right, naked mole rat. That is, that is shocking. <laughs> right? Yeah, I hit you with uh, whatever and you just bounce off, right? I just The tumors will not form. Right. Uh, I suspect that what they will do is they'll get micro tumors and they just won't grow. I think that's what that means. Right. right. 
um, they'll just never get past that wart stage. Now, all right, naked mole rat, give it up. You know, what's your secret? And the naked mole rat makes a lot of hyaluronic acid. And that's the connective tissue that holds us all together. Not only does it make a lot of it, the kind that it makes is bigger and kind of denser. Right, the, the uh, hyaluronic acid depends on the Dalton weight of the molecules. They're the small, medium, and large. So you're saying it has a lot of the largest? It has an enormous amount of large hyaluronic acid and it has very little hyaluronidase. So the enzyme uh, that would break it down, it hardly makes any. Now, right. that's the same enzyme you find in spider venoms and snake venoms and such, because it has to break down the tissue, right? That's uh, just tissue destruction. Mm -hmm. so, Hyaluronidase has a place for tissue remodeling, but we really want to keep it um, at bay, I think. So uh, what I do personally to be more, my, more like the naked mole rat is I eat hyaluronic acid, and then I also take uh, uh, hyaluronidase inhibitors. I take things that suppress um, that particular enzyme in my body. Okay. Right. So, so there probably is a product that you have put all of this in, isn't there? Well, I don't want to be selfish, you know, if I'm going to make it for myself and I'll make it available. Um, okay, so yeah, what I did is I took all the things I learned from these three animals. Um, I took the uh, elagic acid from the, for the TP53 gene from elephants, uh, ant extract uh, for the uroidal, for the, uh, and I took um, hyaluronic acid, and uh, hyaluronic acid enzyme inhibitors, and then a couple of other things that I, I put into the mix that help each of them work better. Uh, so for instance, cat's claw and curcumin and other things that, uh, and, and amla and uh, uh, sorbyl, fat soluble uh, vitamin C, palmitate. So I put all those things together because I wanted for myself something that I could do so I could say, you know what? I'm not gonna live forever, but I certainly, I can do this. I can do this thing for this uh, to help support my body, be more like these resistant animals. Uh, the product is called mitopinol, and it's a powder, and you know, spoonful a day, and there you go. I like how you named it. Thinks, thinks of mitosis protecting the uh, cell, cell division. Yeah. So I, I think that what we really need is to think about uh, cancer from a couple of perspectives. Um, I want to detox my body, detox, keep my body toxic free as much as possible. So the causes that I can control, the metals jamming up the pumps and everything, those are kept to a minimum. I want a really powerful surveillance system. That's uh, the TP53 and the gene repair. Uh, I want something that can uh, if it is going to, um, if I do get it, I don't want it to grow past the tiny wart stage, right? So there's the hyaluronic acid. Cancer has a voracious appetite for ammonia. So just like for plants, if you fertilize plants with nitrogen, they grow really fast, cancer will eat ammonia. It's learned how to eat our toxins. That's part of what defines it. So let's just say that I think there's a lot of potential for research in attaching ammonia to things like zinc that would get preferentially sucked into the cancer by virtue of its voracious appetite for ammonia, yet the cancer might not be able to get rid of the zinc because it's got its mineral transporters all jammed up mm. and then it might not be able to survive the high level of zinc that it's pulling in but can't get out. And right on. let's just leave it at that. Poison the cancer with goodness. Yeah, love it to, love it to death. There you, you know, go. Love it to perfectly framed, yes. So to say it here, um, this is a standard disclaimer I want to put out, is just understand the conversation we've gone through. We're explaining physiologically, or we're explaining how cancer expresses itself in the physiology. We're not trying to tell you that there is a new drug that will cure cancer. The only thing we're doing here is we're supporting your body in expressing itself to its original design. So That's a lovely we're, way of putting it. We're not planning to fight cancer. We're not planning to create a drug. All we're doing is enabling nutritionally 
the uh, healthy expression of normal function at the cellular level. Yeah, and if, let's, all the products I make are for research purposes only. If you think that the ingredients in any of our products are something that you'd like to research its effects on your own body, okay. It's becoming more and more prevalent. And I think it's, it's important that we have these conversations where we bring uh, Western medicine and functional medicine or alternative medicine together. I think that we need all of it. Uh, this is why I'm such a fan of um, using ultrasound with my clients. Uh, I want to go and uh, take a look at places that might look uh, a, little, a little funny. And I want to be able to work with our clients um, at a time, at a, at a time, at the window of opportunity that exists for alternative medicine is much larger because you're not gonna hurt anybody with most, well, there, there are some alternative medical things that can hurt someone. There are, you know, black sab you can tear someone right up. And I've, I've seen some very dangerous and very stupid alternative medical protocols for cancer. But there are plenty of uh, things one, one can do that uh, are non-toxic, that are supportive. And, you know, uh, I'll, I'll end it with this. Um, there's uh, two doctors, uh, Dale and Gail Hammond, uh, they're pastors on the, on the the East Coast, I have great respect for them, uh, and they do a lot of work um, with herbs. And what they taught me is they said, um, keep switching it up, Spencer. Don't, uh, don't just stick on one or two things because the cancer seems to have an intelligence, it adapts, and you wanna keep it off balance. So, you know, what I, what I came away with with that is have like eight or, eight or 12 things that I'll take and, I'll, and maybe every two weeks I'll be on four of them, but every week I'll shift one out. So I'm continually forcing the cancer to adapt. And the reason I want to do that is because cancers are great at adapting, but adaptation takes energy. There's a, and the cancer cell, like all cells, has a budget. And I want to exhaust it through adaptation. I'm not changing over and over and over again because I think, oh, no, this new thing will work. And the other one didn't. The other one was fantastic. I'm switching out because I'm now forcing the cancer to use more metabolic reserve to now adapt to this. It's like a combination punch. You know, I'm, I'm setting my opponent up. First, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to keep it on the defensive. And my idea is that if I can use, if I can force a tumor to use up enough of its metabolic reserve uh, dealing with one adaptation after another, the same way I work with a biofilm, it becomes easier, I think, uh, to, to, uh, to win the war. Right. Yeah, you, you cause energetic deficit and it will diminish rather than grow. And yeah, and of course, you know, the ketosis and the oxygen and the pH, all do the whole thing, you know? That, that's the nice thing about alternative medicine is you really can, um, you can do a shotgun approach. You can, do, you can come at it from a lot of angles. And in most cases, they're all complementary. Not always, you know, there's some protocols where one protocol is directly counter to another, but most of them uh, are very complementary. Great. So my top in all supports the uh, normal function of cells at the cell. I'm not making any claims other than it has some ingredients and it's, it's this, it's going yeah. to make you healthier. I'm, I'm, all I would ever say is my topinol has the following ingredients and that's it. All right. Well, we'll stick with that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Spencer. So, um, uh, this is Martin Patella, life enthusiast. Reach me at www.life-enthusiast.com by phone at 866-543-3388 or Spencer Feldman and Life Enthusiast. We restore vitality to you and to the planet. Thank you. Thanks, Martin.